Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. What a bunch of fanatics you are here, but that just thrills me. This is Francis Hunter coming to you from the City of Light School of Ministry, where we have the world's most excited and exciting students. Am I correct in that? Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, this week is going to be one of the most exciting weeks of your entire life because we're going to teach you how you can heal the sick. You know, we have a motto at the City of Light, if Charles and Francis can do it, I can do it too. So you see, we're going to teach you all how to be super smart, how to lay hands upon the sick, and to know that they're going to be healed. And then Charles and I can sit down and relax and not have to ever do anything again. Wouldn't that be wonderful? No, that wouldn't be wonderful at all. Let me tell you where uh, healing the sick comes from or where the vision that God gave us to encourage us to teach the body of Christ how to heal the sick. We're going to be teaching all this week from the book How to Heal the Sick. And uh, I hope that you'll read that book, study it, restudy it, restudy it, restudy it, and restudy it until you're as smart as we are. Well, actually, you'll be smarter than we are because then you'll know what we know about healing and then you'll know what you know in addition to what we know, so that really makes you smarter than we are. But we want to share some things with you that will help you, I believe, tremendously in this area. In June of 1980, and I guess it was right after our first camp meeting, God gave me a vision. And it was an exciting vision, which I didn't understand. How many of you believe that we're living in the days of dreams and visions? God said, the last days I shall will pour, I pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall dream dreams, and your old men shall see visions. And so, no, just the other way around. Your young men shall see visions, and your, and your old men shall dream dreams. That's why Charles says he never dreams, because he's a young man. He only has visions, and if it happens at night, it is a night vision. But in this particular instance, God gave the vision to me, and I saw the world globe, but it was different than what I normally saw it. I saw the world, the world, gold with, uh, the world globe with little bands of gold and silver on it. And you might think, if you were getting a godly vision, that it would be a very orderly thing, that all the little bands would go around just in a perfect relationship to each other. They would all be the same size, but they weren't. I guess that's why I had difficulty understanding the vision and wondering if I had eaten something at night that disagreed with me, and that's why I had the dream or vision. But that wasn't it at all. The globe was covered with little uh, gold and silver, and it looked like little rivulets that went all over the place. Every once in a while, you would see a little thing that would go like this, little bitty tiny uh, stream of gold and silver, and then all of a sudden, you would see a great big glob of this precious metal. And then it would go on a little bit further, and you'd see another little thing. And there was no order, at least to me it didn't see that way, there was actually no rhyme or reason for the way it looked, and it might have even looked a little messy if you wanted to look at it uh, as an artist or something like that. Then I began to see people standing up on these lines that went all over the earth. And there were people of all nationalities. We had people from Africa, we had people from China, from Japan, from Thailand, from Indonesia, from Norway, from Sweden, from Denmark, from Russia. We saw people of all nationalities rising up on the bands of the globe. And I got real excited. I thought, oh, wow, we hadn't even started our school of ministry yet. We were starting it that fall. And I thought, oh, wow, God's a better public relations agent than we are because I can see what he's doing. He's going to bring us students from all over the world. So I could see coming in here students from Africa and students from Taiwan and from China and from Japan. And I could just see a real international school here. And I saw them reaching out, preaching the gospel, 
laying hands on the sick, and I saw the sick being healed. So I thought, oh, Father, I just thank you for that because that means that we're going to be able to bring people in here, we're going to be able to train them, and then they're going to go out and they're going to be able to win the world for Jesus. But that wasn't exactly what God had in mind because I couldn't figure out how he was going to get all the students over here from all these foreign countries. But then God spoke that it was through the video schools that he was going to do it that he would bring us students here at the City of Light so that they could have live teaching. And as we taught them live on how to heal the sick and the gifts of the uh, spirit, that they would take the message out wherever they went to. They would go back and teach it to their people. And if you're from Oregon, You'll take it back to Oregon and you'll teach it there. If you're from uh, Africa, you'll take it back to Africa and teach it there. But in addition to that, it would be through the video schools that there would be a tremendous impact made upon the body of uh, Christ. And so we started vid videoing. I, I still couldn't understand why we would have these big globs and then little bitty things. And it didn't really make any sense to me at all until God began to reveal that these big splats of this precious material of gold and silver were concentrated areas of population. In other words, uh, there would be many students that would go to your metropolitan areas, say New York City, but there are many little rural areas that need to hear the message of Jesus Christ as well as your big cities. And many times it's the little areas where people never go. There are many areas up in Canada close to the Yukon border where nobody ever goes because uh, sometimes you'll have a little town that has 150 people in it and it may be 500 miles from the closest town. It's very difficult for an evangelist to get there because we have to be practical. An evangelist has to be able to pay their way as they go uh, because they just can't run around without ever having a source of income. And it's very hard to travel five miles and know that if you got everybody in the city into the meeting, you'd only have 150 and that would include the children as well. And so God showed us that through the video schools, we were going to be able to reach these unreachable areas uh, in the United States. And there are many areas like that in the United States. How many of you believe that even in this country where we have Christian television going all over the uh, place all the time, some cities have 24 hour day television. How many of you believe that there are areas that are never touched by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many little cities, little out of the way places where an evangelist never goes because many evangelists are like Charles and I, we have difficulty accepting all the invitations that we get because there just isn't enough time in the schedule. And so many of these little places have to be uh, ignored in an evangelist travel schedule, but they don't have to be ignored through a video school because they can, they can have the highest type of teaching by the outstanding teachers, not only in the nation, but in the world. And that's what we bring you here at the City of Light School of Ministry. We bring you the most outstanding teachers, not only in the United States, but he, people who are renowned around the world. And that message then can go to all these little bitty out of the way places who never have an opportunity to hear people who are really outstanding. We were, we wrote the book, How to Heal the Sick. And when we finished it, and this one isn't very pretty because it happens to be my teaching copy and it has been used a lot. But we wrote the book, How to Heal the Sick, and then we weren't sure exactly how to start it. And uh, we went up to Kansas and we went to a church there and we shared the vision that God had given us about reaching the world through video schools and teaching the body of Christ to be common, ordinary, everyday, miracle-working people. 
Now, how many of you want to be a common, ordinary, everyday, miracle-working person? Certainly, we all do. And can we all be taught? Yes, we can all be taught. So we were sharing with this pastor up in Kansas, and he said, did you ever hear the vision or the, uh, that God gave to Tommy Hicks, who was a Methodist uh, evangelist and world traveler, a very outstanding Methodist man, he said, did you ever hear the vision that God gave to him? And we said, no. Well, they managed to get, get a copy of that to us. And so we put that in the front of the book, How to Heal the Sick, to give you an idea of what God said through a vision to an outstanding man 20 years ago. And it agrees perfectly with the vision that God gave us 20 years later. Now, I'm going to read this to you. And I'm going to read it and ask God to anoint your ears to hear in a special way today. Maybe there will be one sentence in here that will change your whole life. Now maybe the whole vision will communicate with you because it really excites me. But I want you to listen to every single word and every single sentence because there's something in here for everybody about the end time ministry. Tommy Hicks says, my vision begins July 25, about 2.30 in the morning. Now this was in 1961. He said, at Winnipeg, Canada, I had hardly fallen asleep when the vision and the revelation that God gave me came before me. The vision came three times exactly in detail the morning of July 25, 1961. I was so stirred and so moved by this revelation that this has changed my complete outlook upon the body of Christ and upon the end time ministry. The greatest thing that the Church of Jesus Christ has ever been given lies straight ahead. How many of you believe that? In other words, what he was saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. And that's exactly the way I feel. I believe that the day is going to come when we will come to church and the worship and the praise will be so exciting that while we're worshiping and praising God, people's goiters will fall off, people's cancer lumps will fall off, people's legs will grow out. I believe that sometime you'll be standing in a church and the man next to you will grow three feet because he's got artificial legs. And God will begin to grow those artificial legs on, and so he'll just be standing on top of wooden pegs. You know what? That might sound way out, but it's not. It is not, because Jesus said that we would do the things that he did if we believed, and then he went on to say we would do even greater things because he went to be with his Father. This is the day of greater things. This is not one of those things that's going to happen 20 years down the line. It is happening right now. The church has seen nothing by the side of what they're going to see in this next year. He said, it is so hard to help men and women to realize and understand the thing that God is trying to give his people in the end times. I received a letter several weeks ago from one of the native evangelists down in Nairobi or down in Africa in Nairobi. This man and his wife were on their way to Tanganyika. They could neither read nor write, but we had been supporting them for over two years. As they entered into the territory of Tanganyika, they came across a small village, and the entire village was evacuating because of a plague that had hit the village. He came across natives that were weeping, and he asked them what was wrong. They told him of their mother and father who had suddenly died two days or three days before that. They had to leave, but they were afraid to go in where their parents were, so they were leaving them in the cottage. He turned and asked them where they were, and they pointed to the hut, and he asked them to go with him, but they refused because they were afraid. So the native and his wife went into this little cottage where the men and women had been dead, men and women had been dead for three days. He simply stretched forth his hand in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, spoke a man's name, spoke the woman's name and said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command life to come back into your bodies. And instantly, these two people, two heathen people who had never known Jesus Christ 
as their Savior and Lord, sat up and immediately began to praise God. Hallelujah. The Spirit and the power of God came into the life of these people. Now, to us, this may seem strange and a phenomenon. How many of you think that's pretty neat? Amen. All right. It may seem strange and a phenomenon, but this is the beginning of the end time ministries. God is going to take the do-nothings, maybe you'll fall in this category, the do-nothings, the nobodies, the unheard of, the no accounts. How many of you fall in that category? Raise your hands. All right. Watch out when you raise your hand because you're the ones that God is going to take in this end time ministry and give you an outpouring of the Spirit of God. Now, I have to stop right here just a moment because just before this book was finished, we were down in Florida and we were we read this whole vision one night. Now, we'd been, this was our first night that we read the vision. We had no daytime meetings because they had a school in session there. So during the day, a lady who had heard us during the, the uh, who had heard us at the evening service took a group of children swimming that day. Now, this was probably the shyest woman that I have ever seen in my entire life. She had such a little bitty voice that you couldn't even hardly hear when she said hello. And she was very much in a shell, not an outgoing type, not an extroverted type at all. Very soft, very quiet spoken little individual. So she took these kids to a lake very close to the church where we were. And when she got there, there was a big crowd around one of the, uh, around the end of the lake. So they ran over to find out what the problem was. And a little boy had just drowned some five or 10 minutes prior to that. So the first thing, now I want you to think, the first thing that you would probably do is console the mother. Everybody says he's dead. So you would come over and put your arm around her and you would try and console the mother. And that's what she started to do when God dropped into her mind what we had been teaching the night before about the fact that God was going to use the little nobodies, the little do-nothings, the, the unheard of, the no accounts. And those were the ones that he was going to pour out of his spirit on in these last days. So she said to the kids, get in a circle. We're going to pray. And so I want to sh I'm telling you this story to show you that it doesn't make any difference whether you have those real super fancy prayers or not. It's what's inside of your heart that really counts. So she had these, has these kids all together and she says, oh, now what did Charles and Francis tell me to do? And she said, oh, oh, I remember. So she said, spirit of death, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of that child. And then she said, oh, what will I say next? Oh, I know. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command life to come back into this body. And then she said, now what else did they tell me to do? How many of you know you don't always remember everything that we tell you in a teaching session? They remember, she remembered all. And she said, now what else did I do? And then she remembered that we said use common sense. How many of you believe common sense is very vital in healing the sick and living a Christian life? And so she said, they said use common sense. All right, now let's see how good you are on your common sense today. What happens when you drown? You get water in your lungs. So what needs to be done? You need to get the water out. So she said, water, I command you to come out of those lungs in the name of Jesus. Now what else happens when you drown? You've been dead 10 minutes. Your brain, all right. Your brain begins to function. Your, your brain uh, can uh, totally disintegrate to the point where you'll never be able to think normally again. And so she said, brain, in the name of Jesus, I command you to, to be normal. Because she didn't know what else to say. <laughs> so she stood there and she thought, well, that's all I can remember. Thank you, Father. Amen. How many of you got to the end of the story before I did? How, come on, let me see how smart you are this morning. How many of you know that the boy lived? How many of you know that there's not a thing in the world wrong with that boy? Now, do you know what this did to this girl? We saw her recently. She's no longer that shy, little, retiring girl. She's a tiger! She's a tiger! Hallelujah! You know why? 
because God is going to take the little nobodies, the do-nothings, the unheard of, and he's going to pour out the Spirit of God on them in these end times. All right. It says in the book of Acts, we read that in the last days, God said, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. He said, I do not think I fully realized, nor could I understand the fullness of it. But then I read from the book of Joel, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain. That's Joel 2.23. It is not only going to be rain, the former rain, and the latter rain, but he is going to give to his people in these last days a double portion of the power of God. How many of you want a double portion of the power of God? Hallelujah. I'll take a triple. Who will go along with me on a triple? There you go. All right. He said, as the vision appeared to me after I was asleep, I suddenly found myself at a great high distance. Where I was, I do not know. But I was looking down upon the earth. Now you see, he translated, okay. Suddenly, the whole earth came into my view. Every nation, every kindred, every tongue came before my sight from the east and the west, the north and the south. I recognized every country and many cities that I had been in, and I was almost in fear and trembling as I beheld the great sight before me. And at that moment, when the world came into view, it began to lightning and thunder. As the lightning flashed over the face of the earth, my eyes went downward and I was face facing the north. Suddenly I beheld what which looked like a great giant. And as I stared and looked at it, I was almost bewildered by the sight. It was so gigantic and so great. His feet seemed to reach to the North Pole and his head to the South. Its arms were stretched from sea to sea. I could not even begin to understand whether this be a mountain or this be a giant. But as I watched, I suddenly beheld a great giant. I could see his head struggling for life. He wanted to live, but his body was covered with debris from head to foot. And at times, this great giant would move his body and act as though it would raise up at times. And when it did, thousands of little creatures seemed to run away. Hideous creatures would run away from this giant. And when he would become calm, they would come back. Then all of a sudden, all right, now I want you to think in your mind what that is. Remember. How many of you are getting a vision of what that really is? Okay, the body of Christ, the head, and what is all, where are all these hideous little creatures? The sin that's in the body of Christ, all right. He said, all of a sudden, this great giant lifted his hand toward the heaven, and then it lifted its other hand. And what it did, these creatures by the thousands seemed to flee away from this giant and go into the darkness of the night. Slowly, this great giant began to rise, and as he did, his head and hands went into the clouds. As he rose to his feet, he seemed to have cleansed himself from the debris and filth that was upon him, and he began to raise his hands into the heavens as though praising the Lord. And as he raised his hands, they went even into the clouds. Suddenly, every cloud became silver. Remember what I was talking about, the gold and the silver on the globe? Okay. Suddenly, uh, every cloud became silver, the most beautiful silver I've ever known. As I watched this phenomenon, it was so great that I could not even begin to understand what it all meant. I was so stirred as I watched it and cried unto the Lord. And I said, oh, Lord, what is the meaning of this? And I felt as if I was actually in the spirit and I could feel the presence of the Lord even as I was asleep. How many of you love to feel the presence of the Lord even when you're sound asleep? Now I want to stop just for a little second right here and tell you because uh, according to God's word, this is the day when we will be having dreams and visions. A dream and a vi or a vision is not something that you understand instantly for the most part. You remember when the sheet came down to Peter with all of the unclean animals on it? He said, Lord, what does this mean? And he pondered until he got the meaning of the vision. And the same thing is true of you and me. When you have a vision or when you have a dream, 
ponder on that. Think of the ramifications. What does this mean? What does that mean? And I believe as you ponder on it, you will discover the real meaning of the dream or the vision. And so he said, and from those clouds, there suddenly came great drops of liquid light raining down upon this mighty giant. And slowly, slowly, the giant began to melt, began to sink itself into the very earth itself. And as he melted, his whole form seemed to have melted upon the face of the earth. And this great rain began to come down. Liquid drops of light began to flood the very earth itself. And as I watched this giant, that seemed to melt, suddenly it became millions of people over the face of the earth. As I beheld the sight before me, people stood up all over the world. They were lifting their hands and they were praising the Lord. And at that very moment, there came a great thunder that seemed to roar from the heavens. I turned my eyes toward the heavens and suddenly I saw a figure in white glistening white who all right the most glorious thing that I have ever seen in my entire life I did not see the face but somehow I knew it was the Lord Jesus Christ and he stretched forth his hand and as he did he would stretch it forth to one and to another and to another and as he stretched forth his hand upon the nations and the people of the world men and women, as he pointed to them, this liquid light seemed to flow from his hands into them, and a mighty anointing of God came upon them, and those people began to go forward in the name of the Lord. I do not know how long I watched it. It seemed it went into days and months. And how many of you would like to be on the receiving end of that liquid light coming out of the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He said, and as I beheld this Christ, as he continued to stretch forth his hand, but there was a tragedy. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. There was a tragedy. There were many people, as he stretched forth his hand, that refused the anointing of God and the call of God. I saw men and women that I knew, people that I felt would certainly receive the call of God. But as he stretched forth his hand toward this one and toward another, they simply bowed their head and began to back away. And each of those that seemed to bow down and back away seemed to go into darkness. Blackness seemed to swallow them everywhere. We were at a meeting one time and I was reading this vision and I had spoken at the beginning about speaking in tongues in the 16th chapter of Matthew. And there was a pastor there of a church who did not believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, nor in the supernatural of God, nor in healing. And as I got to this part, he and some 20 people from his congregation got up and left the building. And as I saw them open the door, there were no lights outside and they were just swallowed up into total darkness. There are people today, beloved, that refuse to accept the call of God and they refuse to do the things that God tells them to do. But I'm glad that you're here because the fact that you're here says to me, I want to be a part of this end time ministry. I want to be somebody who receives that liquid light from Jesus. I want to be one of those who goes out and who lays hands upon the sick and knows that they're going to be healed. He said, I was bewildered as I watched it, but these people that he had anointed and there were hundreds of thousands of people, it says, all over the world, in Africa, England, Russia, China, America, Houston. No, it doesn't say Houston, really. It says America, though. No. All right, I just want to include you in there. The anointing of God was upon these people as they went forward in the name of the Lord. I saw these men and women as they went forward, and I think this is interesting. They were ditch diggers. They were washerwomen. They were rich men. They were poor men. I saw people who were bound with paralysis and sickness and blindness and deafness. And as the Lord stretched forth his hand to give them this anointing, 
they became well, they were healed, and then they went forth. It says, and this is the glorious miracle of it. Those people would then stretch forth their hands exactly as the Lord did, and it seemed as if there was this same liquid fire in their hands. And as they stretched forth their hands, they said, according to my word, be thou made whole. How would you like to point your hands out and see this liquid fire come out of your hands, passing on an anointing to somebody else? Beloved, we're living in the most exciting times that Christians have ever had the opportunity to be alive. If I have a moment at the end of this hour, I'll tell you when we were up in uh, Calgary, Canada one time, how liquid fire came out of the ends of Charles' fingers as we were teaching on the subject of marriage. Well, maybe I better go ahead and tell you right now. He was standing there and all of a sudden it looked like blue flames that were four inches long came out of his fingers. And I heard the voice of God and God said, that's healing power. Tell the first 30 people that get up here that they'll be healed through that liquid fire that's coming out of Charles' fingers. Charles looked, he didn't see a thing. But I praise God that my husband and I have no problem whatsoever when I see something and he doesn't see it, he goes knowing that I've heard God. When God speaks to him and God hadn't said the same thing to me at a meeting, I go right along with Charles because I know that God has spoken to him. I said, Charles, run down. I said to the people, get out of your seats. The first 30 of you are going to be healed. Some 300 people piled up at the front of that auditorium. And the thing that was so exciting is people got out of wheelchairs to come forward to be healed. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. That was in a morning teaching session, by the way. And that was really exciting. They got up and, and they, they threw down their crutches and they ran as fast as they could. How many of you know when they got healed? They were healed before they ever got up. You see, that was their faith that did it. All right? But to me, that was so exciting. Then when Charles, finally, he just waved his hand about 75 or 80 of them fell on the power of God at one time. But when he got to the end, all of a sudden, the flame, you know how when you turn off a, a, a blowtorch, you know, you turn it back and all of a sudden the flame, just the flame light goes back in. And all of a sudden, I said, Charles, it's gone. And that was the end of that. But what a thrill to see that fire coming out of his fingers. The other night, somebody told us they saw fire coming out of our hands. And then it says, as these people continued in this mighty end time ministry, I did not fully realize what it was. And I looked at the Lord and I said, what is the meaning of this? And he said, this is that which I will do in the last days. I will restore all that the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the caterpillar I will just restore all that they have destroyed. This my people in the end times will go forth. As a mighty army, they shall sweep across the face of the earth. And you are part of this mighty army that is going to sweep across the face of the earth. He said, as I was at this great height, I could behold the whole world. I watched these people as they were going to and fro over the face of the earth. Suddenly, there was a man in Africa, and in a moment, he was transported or translated by the Spirit of God, and perhaps he was in Russia, or China, or America, or some other place, and vice versa. All over the world, these people went, and they came through fire and through pestilence and through famine. Neither fire nor persecution, nothing seemed to stop them. Angry mobs came to them with swords and with guns, and like Jesus, they passed through the multitudes and they could not find him. But they went forth in the name of the Lord and everywhere, 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 I like this, everywhere they went, they stretched forth their hands, the sick were healed, the blind eyes were opened. Now here's another interesting thing. I want you to see what a confirmation this is of what Charles and I teach you. He said there was not a long prayer and after I had reviewed the vision uh, many times in my mind, and I thought about it many times, I realized that I never saw a church, 
I never saw a denomination, but these people were going out in the name of the Lord of hosts. You see, it's not what denomination you belong to. These people are going out as a member of the end time army of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> And then he continues, he said, as they marched forth in everything they did as the ministry of Christ in the end times, these people were ministering to the multitudes over the face of the earth. Tens of thousands, even millions, seemed to come to the Lord Jesus Christ as these people stood forth and gave the message of the kingdom, the coming kingdom in this last hour. Oh, he says it was so glorious. It seems as though there were those that rebelled and they would become angry and they would try to attract those workers that were giving the message. And I think we see that today. I think we see that in countries where, the, where there are iron bars, iron doors to keep you from coming in. But you know, the message of God is going to go forth. The message of the kingdom is going to go forth in these end times. How many of you really believe that? Oh, yes. He says, God is going to give the world a demonstration in this last hour as the world has never known. These men and, men and women are of all walks of life. Degrees will mean nothing. I saw these workers as they were going over the face of the earth. Now, this is beautiful. When one would stumble and fall, another would come and pick him up. You know, so many times in the body of Christ, when somebody has a problem, we're so quick to run and pick on that person. I told you so. Well, I knew they weren't going to succeed. Well, I knew this. Well, I knew that. What is our responsibility as a Christian brother and sister? When somebody stumbles, what do we do? Pick them up. You know, today there are so many people taking wax at ministries. Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, Lester Summerall, T.L. Osborne, Charles and Francis Hunter. People are taking pokes at all these ministries that ought to be in the body of Christ. If you have something to criticize, about a ministry, would you do me a favor? Would you pray for them instead? Would you pray for them instead? You see, the body of Christ doesn't need to be tearing each other down. We need to stand together unified. I think of PTL and how they have been chopped to pieces over and over again, many times by the body of Christ. But I love it what he says in this end times uh, when one would stumble and fall, there would be somebody right there to pick them up. There were no big eyes and little U's. And that's what I think is so exciting about the end time revival that is going on right now. You, do you notice that there are not the stars in the ministries that there were a few years ago? Why? Because God is raising up the little nobodies. The end time ministries will not be won by your superstars. The world will be won by common, ordinary people. I believe that with my heart and with my soul. I believe God has picked each and every one of you to be a vital part of this end time ministries because it's not gonna be stars. So if I were you, I'd get the idea of being a star out of my mind. And I would concentrate on being that ordinary person that God wants me to be. He said, there were no big eyes and little U's, but every mountain was brought low and every valley exalted, and they seemed to have one thing in common. There was a divine love, a divine love that seemed to flow from these people as they worked together and as they lived together. It was the most glorious sight I have ever known. Jesus Christ was the theme of their life. They continued, and it seemed the days went by as I stood and beheld this sight. I could only cry, and sometimes I laugh. It was so wonderful as these people went forth across the face of the earth, bringing forth in this last end time. And that love is going to bring unity into the body of Christ. When we can get jealousy and resentment and envy out of our hearts, 
and we can love our brother and sister in Christ. This is when God's end time ministry is going to really come to its maximum height. And then he said, as I watched from the very heaven itself, there were times when great deluges of this liquid light seemed to fall upon great congregations. Oh, hallelujah. And will you hear what happens next? And that congregation would lift their hands and seemingly praise God for hours and even days, even days as the Spirit of God came upon them. God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And that is that exactly this thing. And to every man and woman that received this power and the anointing of God, the miracles of God, there was no ending of it. In other words, it didn't just stop. You just didn't have a flash in the pan experience. It just kept going on and on and on and getting greater and greater. He said, we have talked about miracles. We have talked about signs and wonders. But I could not help but weep as I read again this morning at 4 o'clock the letter from our native workers. This is only the evidence of the beginning for one man, a do-nothing and unheard of, who would dare to go and stretch forth his hand and say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command life to come back into your body. He said, I dropped to my knees and began to pray again. And I said, Lord, I know that this thing is coming to pass and I believe it's coming soon. How many of you believe it is here? It is not coming soon, it is here. And then again, as these people were going about the face of the earth, a great persecution seemed to come from every angle. <clears throat> Suddenly there was a great clap of thunder that seemed to resound around the world, and I heard again uh, the voice that seemed to speak, now this is my people, this is my beloved bride. And when the voice spoke, I looked upon the earth and I could see the lakes and the mountains. The graves were opened and people from all over the world and the saints of all ages seemed to be rising. And as they rose from the grave, suddenly all these people came from every direction. They came from the east and the west and the north and the south and they seemed to be forming this gigantic body. How many of you would like to be driving along a cemetery, a big cemetery, when the rapture comes. Wow, wouldn't that be fun? Woo! We, were, we went by a big cemetery, cemetery in, North, in uh, New York one time with the Amigos. It's one of the biggest cemeteries I've ever seen in this. We were riding along the bus, David said, wow, I'd love to be right here when the rapture comes. Hallelujah. He said, as the dead in Christ seemed to be rising first, I could hardly comprehend it. It was so marvelous. It was so far beyond anything I could ever dream or think of. And you know, I want us to remember at all times, don't be limited by your finite mind. Get your mind into the spirit world where you can believe the impossible things that God is going to be doing in this end times and that God is going to be doing through you, through you, through you. Don't think, oh, somebody else, not me. Oh, through Charles and Francis. No, through you. I believe God will use anybody who wants to be used. It says, but as his body suddenly began to form and take shape again, it took shape again in the form of this mighty giant, but this time it was different. It was arrayed in the most beautiful, gorgeous white. Its garments were without spot or wrinkle. And what kind of a body is Jesus coming back for? A body without a single spot or wrinkle or blemish. And he says, it seemed that the people of all ages seemed to be gathered into this body and slowly, slowly as it began to form up into the very heavens, suddenly from the heavens above, the Lord Jesus came and became the head. And I heard another clap of thunder that said, this is my beloved bride for whom I have waited. She will come forth even tried by fire. This is she that I have loved from the beginning of time. I could hardly wait till I hear Jesus say that. Glory to God. He said, and as I watched, my eyes suddenly turned to the far north and I saw seemingly destruction. Men and women in anguish and crying out and buildings in destruction. 
Then I heard again the fourth voice that said, Now is my wrath being poured out upon the face of the earth. And from the ends of the whole world, the wrath of God seemed to be poured out, and it seemed that there were great vials of God's wrath being poured out upon the face of the earth. I remember it, it as though it happened a moment ago. I shook and trembled as I beheld the awful sight of seeing the cities and whole nations going down into destruction. I could hear weeping and wailing. I could hear people crying. They seemed to cry as they went into caves, but the caves and the mountains opened up. They leaped into the water, but the water would not drown them. You know what the Bible says? The spirit of death will have been removed from the earth. He said there was nothing that would, could destroy them. They were wanting to take their lives, but they could not. Then again, I turned my eyes to this glorious sight, this body arrayed in beautiful white shining garments. And slowly, slowly it began to lift from the earth. And as it did, I awoke. What a sight I beheld. I had seen the end time ministries the last hour. Again, on July 27 at 2.30 in the morning, the same revelation, the same vision came exactly as it did before. My life has been changed as I realize that we are living in that end time. For all over the world, God is anointing men and women with this ministry. Listen carefully. It will not be doctrine. Amen. It will not be churchanity. Amen. It is going to be Jesus Christ. They will give forth the word of the Lord and are going to say, I heard it so many times in the vision and according to my word, it shall be done. And then he makes a plea that really touched my heart. He said, oh, my people, listen to me. According to my word, it shall be done. We are going to be clothed with power and an anointing from God. Who? We are. Some of us? No. All of us who are willing to make that total commitment. He said, we won't have to preach sermons. We won't have to have people heckle us in public. We won't have to depend on man, nor will we be denomination echoes, but we will have the power of the living God. We will fear no man, but will go forth in the name of the Lord of hosts. Do you see how that vision ties in with the vision that God gave us? God is raising up in this end time an army of people who are finding a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ in a greater way than they ever dreamed was possible. God is raising up people where Jesus is the core, the very heart, the center of their lives. And those are the people that God is going to use in these end times. God is not going to use the people who are halfway committed. God is not going to use the people who are lukewarm. And beloved, God is not going to use people who have got sin in their lives. God is not going to use people who have sin in their lives. You might fool somebody in the school. You might fool your pastor. You might fool me. You might fool Charles but you cannot fool God. How many of you know that? Amen. So, how, so you see, God will not tolerate sin. And this is why it is so vital that anything, any little thing in our life that is not pleasing to God ought to be removed instantly and immediately. Now, Charles and I, several years ago, for a period of approximately two years, brought pastors to our seminars to teach them the supernatural. As a matter of fact, one of the pastors went back and was teaching at a huge Bible school 
and he was teaching them how to operate the gifts of the Spirit, and he was teaching them on how to heal the sick. And somebody said, where did you learn that? Because he had gone to the same school as all the rest of them had, and he, they hadn't learned it at all. And he said, I went to a seminar of Charles and Francis Hunter, and he said, they taught me. And somebody said, do you believe? Do you believe? Do you mean? Do you honestly think that the supernatural can be taught? How many of you believe the supernatural can be taught? Yes. It's all the power of God. But do you believe the Bible can be taught? Well, the Bible is supernatural. All right. So if the word can be taught, then the supernatural can be taught. And that's why we have this school of ministry, which is a how-to school. How to heal the sick. How to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. And before this week is over, each and every one of you will have an opportunity to lay hands on somebody and to watch God's miracle power work. Is it God's word that we all be healed? Is it God's will that we all be healed? Oh, say that again. Oh, I love you students. I love you students. You have learned well. Yes, it is God's will. He says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. Now, one of the things about learning how to heal the sick to be a part of this end time ministry is to be open to what the Spirit of God says, to listen to what God says, and to put into action the things that you have learned. Now we can have a great healing seminar this week. We can teach you all that we know, but if you go out and do nothing about it, we might as well have stayed in bed this week. How many of you believe that's right? That's right. Now, I want you to take notes. I want you to listen. I want you to read the book, How to Heal the Sick. I want you to get so involved in healing that healing will be a second nature thing with you. That when somebody comes up to you in your church, you won't say, well, I'll have to take you over to the pastor. You'll lay hands on them right then and there. We were so excited. Last week we got a call from a video school and their students have been such good students and have learned so much about the supernatural that the Catholic Church in their area has asked them to come in and have a healing service every Saturday night. Now this is hallelujah, hallelujah. This is this is from people who sat and watched on video, who sat and watched on video and who learned on video and who were such exceptional students that they could hardly wait to go out and to put in practice. Now, you know what happens when you begin to go out and become a doer of the word? All of a sudden, people are going to say, I want you to come over to my church. I want you to come over to my church. I want you to come over to my church. I'm excited as I see some of the graduates from last year going out into the body of Christ, uh, laying hands upon the sick, seeing them healed. I get excited when I see the churches that are starting up. We just got a, a letter this last week, and one of our students from last year said, we're having to get into a bigger church because there isn't room enough for the people to fall out under the power of God in the little bitty building that we have. Hallelujah. Well, you see, the, and believe me, these are people who were do-nothings, who were nobodies, who were unheard of, who were no accounts, but people who believed that the supernatural could be taught. You know, Hebrews 13, 8 tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he healed yesterday, is he going to heal today? Or if he healed today, how about tomorrow? Is tomorrow an unknown quantity? Or is tomorrow the same as today? Let me give you another good scripture. I love this. Matthew, the 8th chapter, verses 1, 2, and 3 in the Living Bible. Large crowds followed Jesus as he came down the hillside. Look, a leper is approaching. He kneels before him, worshiping. 
Sir, the leper pleads, if you want to, you can heal me. And Jesus touches the man. I want to, he says. What did he say? What did he say? I, want to. I didn't hear you. He says, I want to. Is it Jesus' will to heal you? Yes. yes. He says, I want to. All right. He says, and he said, be healed. And instantly, the man's leprosy disappeared. I can hardly wait for the time when I get to go to a leprosarium and say, be healed. To stretch forth my hand in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, say the same words that he did and see the same things happen. I can hardly wait for some of you to get into a leprosarium and to lay, oh, Francis, I wouldn't go in a place like that. How many of you believe that God will protect you? You're absolutely right. How are they going to get healed if you don't go in there? And then John 14, 12, which we emphasize all the time and which is our key scripture for this year. <clears throat> Jesus said, verily or most assuredly, I guess he says in the New King James, most assuredly I say unto you, he who believes in me, the works that I do shall he do, and even greater things because I go to be with my Father. You are in that generation who is going to do the end time miracles that are greater than the ones that the Lord Jesus Christ did. He that believeth on me. How many of you believe on him? Okay. How many of you believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that you personally are going to do greater works than Jesus did? You see whose hand goes up first? Oh, I didn't get my hand up first that time. I tell you, I've got such a bu bunch of good students in here that you get your hands up first. There is no doubt in my mind that you and I are those people that are going to do the greater works than Jesus ever did. When are we going to do them? Next year? When? Now. now. How many of you really believe it is now? All right, in Hosea 4, 6, it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. When this week is over, you will not have a lack of knowledge. You, too, will be able to go out and heal the sick. And just like Jesus did, he healed them all. Hallelujah. How to Heal the Sick, Hour 2. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love you fanatics. <laughs> I really do. You know, that's the one thing about teaching in a video school of ministry or in a school of ministry. You have so much fun coming in contact with people who have given up nine months of their life or whatever it takes to, to, to you to give up well you're not really giving up you're investing it in a whole lifetime of work that god wants to do uh, for you this is francis hunter from the city of light school of ministry and i forget to say that once in a while but this today we're going to be teaching on laying on of hands and this is chapter three in the book how to heal the sick and I'm going to pray and believe that before this book is over, somebody will give me a very pretty, uh, pretty book. Uh, to, oh, you're going to give me one, Charles. All right, very good. I think it'd be nice if the video school got to see a real attractive cover, don't you? Instead of the one that's all beaten up. Well, we use this one for teaching all the time because it's marked with some simple things that we like to emphasize. Probably every person who has ever been in the healing ministry or who has ever uh, prayed for the sick, if you want to call it that, uh, you'll notice that we don't teach you to pray for the sick. We teach you to be scriptural and lay hands upon the sick because that's what the Word of God says. But probably 
all of us who have done this for a number of years have one way or the other which is a favorite. And what I'm teaching today is the one that is my favorite. Now it's not Charles' favorite because he has another way that he likes better, but this happens to be my particular way. Mark 16, verse 17 and 18 says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Let me see all those believers here today. Okay, all right, you're believers. So signs and wonders are definitely going to follow you. If signs and wonders are not following you, is that God's fault? Is that Jesus' fault? Whose fault is it? You're right, because God's word says that signs and wonders and miracles are going to follow the believer. Every believer ought to have signs and wonders following them. I'm sorry to tell you that there are a lot of believers who don't. How many of you know that? You're right, okay. Too many believers, and I have to put that quote, that believers in quotes, are always complaining that the devil is following them. Oh, devil follows me all the time. Oh, he's really been after me this week. Again, I want to remind you that that is an unscriptural statement to make when you say the devil has been after me all week. The devil has been following me. The devil is giving me so many problems in my life. Who are you listening to when you say that? The devil. I like to listen to God. How many of you like to listen to God? How many of you think what he says is a lot neater? Well, it certainly is. He says to me, signs and wonders and miracles are going to follow me. I like that. I like that much better than problems and horrible situations are going to follow me. If the devil follows you, give him a good kick and tell him to get out in the name of Jesus. Remember, you have more power than the devil. How many of you believe that? Now I'm going to throw you a good question. How many of you...